talking about for that one well that was the montreal show we went to right okay laval good, good. the montreal yeah the laval show in that new arena right yeah it was fantastic yeah oh was it okay uh God, it I was, was I, more than okay i was really worried about that building because when i looked up i thought it's a great building but they haven't it's new and they haven't put any kind of acoustic uh you know drop ceiling or tiling or anything like that to absorb it i just wondered oh god it but luckily was, we got a it was very bassy. I remember that. Yeah, I, uh, I can imagine. I can imagine. But yeah, it, it brought a little man tear to my eye. <laughs> Good. I like. I like man tears. The, um, <laughs> no, it was. Uh, I remember the audience. The uh, the crowd was on fire. So I just remember the. Uh, I remember that mostly of it, and that it, that it went over really, really well. But I also remember being in the sound check, going, "Whoops." This this could be this could be a this could be a trap. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, compared to the other two bands, you guys had fantastic sound. The other the yeah, other but, bands, I guess, because it was a little emptier for Tesla. Um, yeah, so it was bouncing around a little more. Sometimes when you put when you put more, you know, meat uh, meat sound absorbers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it, helps. The, uh, it helps it helps it can help but i remember i remember cooking our our sound guy is really great and he um he wasn't he wasn't over he wasn't disappointed so that's good at the end of the night but i remember i remember him fighting it a little bit in the sound check it was good. Uh, it was liked, fantastic it. and i think you know you mentioned that the crowd was on fire and uh not trying to be a, a kiss ass here but i think a lot of that had to do with you speaking french Ah, you know, and I, so. I think that really went over well with, uh, you know, the, the, the people in Quebec really appreciate that. Boy, did they ever. The, uh, I just did a TV show about three weeks ago just to promote this tour uh, called Belly Bum. And so, you know, I was cobbling together my, my version of French for that. But the, again, same thing. They, that, that just hasn't gone away. People do appreciate that. I, I think it's just simple. For me, it's simple. I'm just trying to be polite. <laughs> Well, <laughs> isn't that the, isn't that the Canadian thing? <laughs> well, absolutely, but it goes over so yeah. well. I mean, I remember um, uh, when you were introducing uh, a criminal mind. It was just incredible to. I mean, I was I was in the back and I was watching the people. They were all French around me, and mm. they were just smiles on their faces as you were introducing the song in French. That's great. Yeah, so I think that had a lot to do with it. I may, you may be right. I mean, the um, I think I think in another way with you know with a criminal mind, I think. I think Sticks playing it, and you know, we started playing it right the first year I joined the band is 20 years ago. But actually, the day that I joined the band, I remember Tommy saying, "Can we make a Criminal Mind a Sticks song?" And I'm like, "Yes, absolutely." <laughs> so, so it was like, uh, so we, I remember we learned it, and you know, we periodically play it throughout the year. You know, always if we're in Canada, uh, quite often we did one full year where we played it. We did it for a live record, and we also did it for a live. Sim- symphony record but the um the I, I think in some ways the the validation of the song by having it played by a band that's you know of the, the legacy of sticks is um i think I, I don't think that's lost on the audience either at least that's what i you know that's what i uh, that's what i sense from the stage is that it's kind of it underscores the uh the uh, the impression that, this, that the song made on people. I, I was going to take credit for that in Montreal, actually, because I, I mentioned you should play that last time we spoke. So I, you I did. Thought, I thought that was uh, that was because of me, but obviously Great. not. <laughs> no, I think it, it probably it probably was because I always keep in mind I keep whoever I can blame it on if it bombs. So I probably had your name there. It did not bomb. You wanna, it was fantastic. Yeah. You 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 want to know who's responsible for this? Kenneth Van Tour. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Blame it on me. I'll I'll take full responsibility for that. Absolutely. All right. Well, good. So let's let's talk about that. That's that's something I wanted to mention to you actually because I remember at the show you did mention that you know it was a Gowan song in the '80s. It became a Stick song 
uh, when you joined the band, and now yeah. you're going back to doing it on a solo tour. Uh, yeah. How does it How does it change? I study. Well, first of all, the Sticks version of it is is I'd say eighty percent faithful to the original. Uh, we do the single version of it, which is the um, the version that was on the video. Right. Uh, and and you know any, anything that was on AM radio back then. So it's that version that, that we do with Sticks. We do a key change in the middle of it with Sticks. When I go back and listen to the original in order to you know rehearse as close to the as close to that as I can possibly get, I do it with uh, in for this show in Ottawa. Todd Sickerman, our drummer, is, is will be with us. And he, luckily, he is a huge fan of Jerry Murata, who was Gabriel's drummer back in the um, 70s, 80s, and, and uh, was is the drummer that's on uh, the original um, Strange Animal album, the whole album. And Todd basically microscopes what Jerry did and more or less duplicates it with, with little, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't need much. When he plays it with sticks, he, he infuses it with his own you know, personality, but he really sinks into what Jerry was doing with it when uh, when we do that version, as does, you know, the guitarist I had back in the 80s is, is, is back with us again, and I remember, you know, he, he basically just duplicates what he heard on the record. He did back then, and that's how he approaches it now. So, really, it was, it was well recorded originally. It was really well mixed. It sounded just like 1985, you know, at that time. And uh, I guess at that time we thought it was going to be a very, like all pop music, rock music, then was, it was looked upon as being probably quite disposable and would be loved and forgotten in a couple of years. But here we are 35 years later. Obviously something about that version has, uh, has stood the test of time just as the melody of the song has. And so we will adhere as closely to that as we possibly can in the show. But there's always that margin where it's going to be a little, it's going to rock a little bit harder. It's going to be a little bit tougher. I'm going to lean into the vocal a little bit more. That's basically, you know, to answer your question of how do you approach it. it it's like that, but with just a little more, just a little more fur on it. If you know what I mean? You know, because the, uh, the, the, the live audience always raises the, uh, the intensity of it. Absolutely. And I'm really happy you're bringing uh, Todd Zuckerman with you. I mean, that is uh, one thing that I noticed from the show. I I saw Sticks once with him before the show in Montreal, and that was way back, like Return to Paradise type era. Oh, 96. That was his first tour was 96. Right. And um, I couldn't believe what he he brings (laughs) to the live experience of a Sticks show. Yeah. Well, he was just voted again. He was voted number one classic rock. Drummer in Modern Drummer Ma- Drummer Magazine. Last year he was voted number one progressive rock drummer. So he's been number one in several reader polls of, of that of that Drummer Magazine now for for years. And uh, you know he fortunately you know he really he really embraces my own catalog. When we first met, he actually the show we did in Montreal. He actually went and bought my current album at that time, which was called Gallon of Quebec. And he, he brought it backstage. He said, I really like these songs. He said, sorry, I don't speak French. <laughs> <laughs> that was our first meeting. Our next meeting, funny enough, it's, it's great how far we go back. Uh, our next meeting was in England when I was playing at the um, the opening of Princess Diana's um, Memorial in 1998. It had a, a, an original piece called Healing Waters that uh, I played with the London Symphony on that show. And, he, you know, so he saw me again. But on the bill was like Duran Duran and uh, Sir Cliff Richard. And, you know, he came up to me again the second time. He goes, I'm Todd from Sticks. Do you remember last year we did a show? And, and then the following year, I'm in Tommy Shaw's house and I'm singing Sticks songs. And Todd comes up to me with, do you remember last year in England? And, <laughs> and, and he, he, what he doesn't understand is if anybody's ever seen him play the drums, you're not going to forget who he is <laughs> very quickly. right? No, he is so, something special. Yeah, he is. He is. I had. Um, well, I have him on this run on this run of shows. Uh, now my my son is also a, a, a excellent drummer, formidable drummer, who basically has been watching Todd since he was six years old, and learned everything you know everything he possibly could from him. And, and he played with me in a few shows in the last 
10 years, uh, three, and, uh, you know, I was back and forth as to whether it, whether it would be my son Dylan or it would be Todd on this tour because I, Todd gets booked on all these uh, clinics around the world. But um, luckily, Dylan had already booked shows with his own band, and then Todd said, I'm, I'm keeping that, those two weeks open if you, if uh, it's going to be me. And I said, well, it's absolutely going to be you. So Fantastic. Ottawa's going to get an extra little cherry on top. <laughs> he blew me away. He absolutely blew me away. And I guess I should say congratulations. The show sold out, apparently. I, I tried to get tickets the other day, and they're they're all gone. That one, I think, was the first one to sell out. I think I think of the nine of them, seven of them are are, are sold out at this point, and the other two are, are down to, like, fumes. At least that's what I've been told. Now, is that something yeah. that uh, that's going to be quite different for you? I mean, you're playing pretty big shows these days with sticks. Yeah. You're going into a smaller venue. Does, is there a, a difference in approach? Not really, because even, even with sticks, although we play, you know, we play everything from football stadiums down to, like, small theaters. You know, in the winter right now, theaters we play are maybe 3,000, 4,000 seats, something like that. So I know the Shankman is probably, like, 1,000, maybe even less. Give or um, take, yeah. Not really. Honest to God, it's... It, it, we we discussed this. So what we love about the big places, you know, are obviously the expanse of the audience. It's, there's, it's just powerful. You just you have this feeling of you know this great broad reach. But you know, and you, we hear lots of musicians say this. The great thing about playing a smaller theater is you get all the concussive and uh, the, the almost the, the the wonderful claustrophobic feeling of playing. A club, which is still the greatest place to play rock music, you know, it just is. You get all of that, but plus the audience is just big enough that you can that you feel like you're connecting to someone who's got you know a few a few yards from you at least. You know what I mean? That they're right. uh, so. No, quite honestly, I think I think that adjustment. To be honest, Kenneth, that adjustment is made probably in the first thirty seconds that you're on stage. Uh, I, it really is like. No matter if you've gone from a football stadium down to a, a small theater, that when you've played as much as we have, you know it, it might be more. Of, it might be a more daunting thing for a band that's you know had recent success and was on their first or second year of touring to go. Wait a minute, and we we scoped this out so it's to this size of a place, you know, speaker wise, stage wise, you know, all our all our all, all, all our moves yeah. <laughs> are kind of locked in this size of the thing. But you have to realize, you know, we have played, we really are veterans. <laughs> so there's just no getting around that word. And uh, so we, we adjust almost, almost instantaneously to the, to, the, uh, to the confines or lack thereof. Huh. Well, you mentioned that clubs are, are and always will be the best place to play. That's what I think. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, everyone wants to get out of the clubs. I know. I know, and then once and then once you're out of the clubs, I'll, I'll, let's talk about Ottawa, for example. I love that I played at Lansdowne Stadium. I love that I played at uh, you know the National Arts Center, and you know there are other very large venues that I've done in Ottawa. But it doesn't take away at all that I also loved the very first you know the moment, with the moment I started started getting just a little bit of chart success. I mean by maybe February, late February of 1985. The album came out in February '85. The single came out. The Criminal Mind came out in January, but it, it it was a gold record in like three weeks. So suddenly there were these shows booked. And I remember the first one for Ottawa was a club that I had played in Rheingold, the band I had you know prior to becoming a solo guy called Barrymore's. So I played Barrymore's in late 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 February or very early March of '85, and I remember that and just. You know, it was just such a difference between the audience response. <laughs> they were so into it, uh, and and the place was, you know, it was a great kind of tiered up old theater anyway that had been converted into a club. But that that absolutely st still sticks in my mind just as much as playing at Lansdowne. Every every bit as much. So really, really, over the course of your career, it becomes inconsequential. Quite honestly, it really does. I can't, for example. I know this will sound weird, but uh, I can't, for example, say, well, playing Lansdowne uh, football stadium 
was any less rewarding or fun than playing at the Super Bowl. I really can't. I can say, well, look, it's not one that I'm going to instantly say. If people say, well, what's what's the biggest show you've ever done? I'm going to say the Super Bowl. I've played two Super Bowls. I'll say, well, it's the Super Bowl. But in my mind, in my you know, in my way of equating things, the football stadium in Ottawa is the you know, or any football stadium that I've, that I've had the chance to play in has been that many. You know, it really is. It, it, it comes down to what the what the crowd generated on that night, and I remember that more than anything. You know, and Barry Moore's National Arts Center, Lansdowne Park. You know, if the crowd that we meet up with on the twentieth in Ottawa and in in Shankman Arts Center, if they can generate that kind of a spirit, it's going to, it's going to equate equally. And I know that probably sounds like I'm making it up. But I'm just I'm not because we all we discuss this quite o- quite often. We, it is it, surprising to someone who's never done anything like that. You know, because you always well, think that the 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 goal is to get to Lansdowne Stadium. It absolutely is. That don't don't that that to say well this is a pinnacle moment. That's never lost on you. I mean, when we look at the year's itinerary, it, not one guy in the band is ever going to is ever going to not look at where where's New York, where's Los you know Los. I mean, this year London the London Palladium we're playing in June, and it's it's sold out. <laughs> and wow. So it's like and it's like we're all looking at that. But we know at the end of the year, this is the this is the weird thing. There might there's going to be some show in some city that's going to exceed as far as whatever happens. It's going to at least be equal to uh, the 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 thing that happens at a rock show. This is part of why a rock show is the greatest form of entertainment I've ever encountered in my life. Is that there can be something that just happens in a, in a, in a city, in a hall, in, a, in whatever the setting is, that just stays with you at, at the end of the year, just as much or maybe even more than, um, than the big city, than the, 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 the marquee, let's call them those, the marquee towns, you know. Right. Um, maybe three years ago, I remember we came off stage in, it was Boise, Idaho, and it was so exhilarating. And I remember Tommy goes, I think uh, this is like maybe show number 60, 70 in the year. He went, I think that was my favorite show of the year. And we all kind of looked at each other and went, what was, what was going on? And what was in the air tonight that, 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 uh, <laughs> that, uh, that made that happen? You know, and that far exceeds the, um, any, anything about the, about the venue itself or the, or, or or the city that it's in. It really comes down to what happened on that night. Right, the atmosphere. Yeah, the atmosphere is everything. It's everything. That's wild. Wow, that's yeah. very interesting. I had no idea. I mean, it, it, it's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, I, I was looking at your schedule. Yeah. You finished with sticks on, I don't know, the 16th or yeah. 17th, right? And then 16th. you start your tour on the 19th, your solo tour. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> When the hell do you have time to practice with your band? What an excellent question. And no one's even asked that yet until you. So excellent question. Yes. So the way you do that is start the band rehearsals in January, in the first week of January. So we, we actually had stick shows uh, between Christmas and New Year's, and then we started again very early in January. I think we started on the 10th. But those first eight days of January, we rehearsed then. Okay. Then there was a week off at the very beginning of this month, and we rehearsed. Then you see we were there again, so we're we are ready. What we have to do though is the the magic trick that's involved is I have to get from Lake Charles, Louisiana, <laughs> to Drummondville, Quebec, and so to do that, and I'm bringing four of the Sticks crew with us uh, along with Todd. So all of us have to kind of leave the Sticks show, fly straight to Toronto in order to get uh, pick up the tour bus there. With um, with all the gear already preloaded, you know, with the crew that are in Canada, get to Drummondville a day before, set up everything, and then have a full day's rehearsal, like a full production rehearsal on the 18th, and the first show is on 19th, and then when we get into Ottawa on the 20th, it'll be like, ah, oh, we know how to do this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, right? You'll be all warmed up. So that There's first a, yeah. that first show in Drummondville might be a a bust. No depending way. on the practice. It will not. It will not be a bust. <laughs> I, 
I'm going to, I'm going to think positively, and uh, you know, we, we we've done it. I, actually, we've done this now nine years in a row. We started we've started doing gallon shows again in 2010, and it's always a crunch to transition quickly from sticks into gallon. But we pick our spots as to where to rehearse and what needs work, and and we're you know the the, the wonderful communication lines that that, that uh, you know. Uh, bulk emails or what do you call them, you know, group emails and, and texts and all that. We, we're on the same page for, by the time we get to Drummondville. Honestly, the the, uh, the production day on the 18th, it'll just be a run through. That's all, that's all it'll have to be because all the, all the heavy lifting has really been done. It's kind of like riding a bike. A little bit like that, I suppose, but um, way more fun. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, speaking of that, how how tough is it to go from being part of an ensemble like Styx, like a band member, to the leader of your own solo band so quickly? Obviously, there's more pressure on you as a performer. Does it does it weigh on you, or does it bother you, or is it a tough transition? The only thing that I'm more, most concerned with in that transition is um, whether whether my voice is in shape to do it. You know, and that's. That's something you can never predict, especially in the winter months. You know, <laughs> it's, so, it's so bloody dry. I, I, I carry around a, like a personal little steam thing that I'm puffing on half the day, you know, just to try to keep moisture in there. And um, it, it's more to do with the physical um, uh, preparation, you know, so to speak, that, uh, that the transition goes. Which honestly, Kenneth, the transition comes the moment the moment we kick off. Cosmetics is always the first song of a gallon show the moment cosmetics is the first song instead of grand illusion much like you asked about the hall uh, it, it's pretty much instantaneous i go from you know i'm not looking across the stage at jy tommy and uh and and, and ricky and chuck uh i'm still looking across at todd <laughs> but but the musically it, there's a different um it, it, there's a different uh Spirit in the air. I'll use that word yet again. It, it, it is just a different feeling that that I immediately glom onto. That, that makes me feel like this is what I do all the time. And then when I go back to sticks, the moment I start singing "Grand Illusion" at the top of the show, that I feel like, well, this is what I do all the time. It really isn't. Uh, there's. I guess the other thing is, I, I, it's not lost on me the feeling of home. When I play the gallon shows, that I have to say, that is more the uh, I have to kind of get myself emotionally in check, you know, because I, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to go as far as to get a lump in my throat, but I just love that the the memories of what we, you and I, have just discussed over the last number of minutes, those those flood my head when I play those sounds and those songs. They, they I, I can't help it, and it takes, you know. Two or three songs into the show before I can kind of let that, you know, you know, settle in my equilibrium, you know, because there's uh, there's no way I'm going to walk on a stage in Ottawa and not remember all the things we just discussed. In addition to, of course, you know, the big blues fest things that I've done there with sticks, you know, those are those are part of it as well. But but those gallon songs and going the transition from obscurity to uh, you know, some level of uh, of recognition is uh, that that's a, I, and I think that might be what you're referring to when we were talking about the size of venues. But that that transition um, never leaves you. That that part of your life never leaves you, and it's impossible not to confront that or uh, you know uh, be or feel it uh, when when you come back to it. So there's definitely going to be that in my. Uh, in my thinking early on in the show, at least. Now, is that because you're playing your solo stuff or because you're back in Canada? Both. Both. Quite honestly, it's both. It's both. So yeah, do, do you get that feeling when you're playing with sticks in Canada as well? I do. I do. I do, funny enough. I mean, I'm I'm aware the whole time that this, this that their career was long laid out before I, you know, walked on from my scene. <laughs> uh, so it's a different it's a different thing entirely. It's a diff, it's, it's a great feeling of... Uh, of uh, you know, you you do feel like you're yeah you know, rubbing shoulders with the rock gods. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of that, and it's nice to have that in your own backyard. Um, and uh, but uh, so yeah, I, it's 
it's the same but different. I'm I'm more okay. Let me then put a, a better, a finer point on that. When I'm there with sticks, it's more the feeling of ah, oh, I love that I'm back in Canada. Okay, I love that I'm back in cities I've played in Canada before, and look at this band that that you know that we're here with. You know, like in Laval, I'm thinking like, well, look at check it out, y'all. <laughs> um, whereas when I go back and play my own uh, music which is, as I said, that's something that never existed until we made that lovely little transition from in, in, into getting people to know us in 1985 on. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged thing. So those, those, mel- those melodies, that place, that atmosphere, and then the faces of the crowd, with, you know, big smiles on their faces. You, you, you put that all together in one concoction, and that's a pretty, pretty potent little uh, moment in your life. I can imagine. Did you think you'd be doing this 35 years later? You know, anybody who gets into music and thinks they're going to be doing it 35 days later, <laughs> you know, <laughs> quite honestly, you don't think that way at all. You did. You kind of think, how long can I? How long can I keep this uh, charade going and not have to get a job? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, quite honestly, that's, that, that, that's still the thought that's in my mind every every day. Every, that thought is never away from my mind, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, oblivious to the fact that I'm lucky, you know, at the time I was born, etc. And the type of music I play is the monolithic musical statement of the last half of the 20th century. So to be connected to that, it, it, that's not going away soon, if ever, you know. Not in my lifetime, it's not because there are too many people in the audience now that weren't even born when those records were made, right. and they've got. They're jumping up and down with every bit as much gusto and enthusiasm for it as people that were there when they first came out. So I, I'm not oblivious to the fact that well, this is a very this is a very fortuitous place to be on the planet. Um, but you know, we're all trying to. I'm going to quote Jay Y right now. We're all trying to keep as much as for as long as we can. We're trying to keep real life from intruding on rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> is it not possible? My quote. That's, my, that's not my quote. It's only possible for the duration of the show, quite frankly. And so we, we kind of live for that. What can people expect from this show? Are you going to oh, do any of your uh, your stick songs? Or are you just doing all Gowan? Like, are you doing some, like, I'm thinking uh, Fields of the Brave, More Love for the Money, all those songs? Or are you just sticking to the, no. the Gowan? We'll stick entirely to to the Gowan uh, catalog because, there, you know, there'll be something from... There'll be something from each. There are six studio albums in total. There'll be something from each of those albums. Probably, I will probably play one piece, even a little piece from the Mission, which is the latest Sticks album, because that one's done so well. And uh, it'll be something that I wrote, and um, that 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 will be the only the only Sticks thing that'll be included in the show. Um, and even with that, it'll come down. Down to because our show is like two hours long. I think we only want like ninety minutes at that theater. So oh. we'll, we, we'll see, we'll see. But there's just there's too much gallon material that uh, that I'm very anxious to play because I get a chance to play all that thick stuff over a hundred times a year. You know, with all the shows that we do. So um, I don't want to play a thick song at the expense of you know what people have come to see on the night. And uh, so it, it will be a cross section from. 1982, even though it'll be even one song from my first album, which was should have been titled um, uh, the Ultimate Obscurity Record. Uh, <laughs> but there'll be at least one from that because over the years, people have, I get too many messages from people who say I got your first album and it's my favorite of all your records, and you're like, oh god, okay, well then I'll play one from that. I'll play at least half of the Strange Animal album, if not more. I'll play at least half of the Great Dirty World album, if uh, yeah, there'll be about half of that one. There'll be because uh, those two were between the two of them, they were a triple platinum, double platinum album. Then um, Lost Brotherhood was the album with Alex Life's on it. We'll do at least, I think at least two from that one, at least four from You Can Call Me Larry because that was the biggest record I had in the '90s. And so yeah, it'll be like that. It really is good stuff. I was listening to uh, a bunch of that stuff yesterday, a bunch of your old albums yesterday, and. Uh, it still it still stands up, you know. After after thirty five years, you would think that you'd. I don't know if it's going to stand up. It does. It is fantastic. Well, 
I'm hearing this more and more from people, and I, I really started hearing it from myself when I realized that, wait, you know, in my time in Sticks, you know, when when first I joined the band you know, 20 years ago, it was definitely the word nostalgia was attached to a lot of the uh, uh, the write-ups on the on the shows, etc. But that's that ended when suddenly the audience increasingly became younger and younger, not older and older. And on any given night, half the audience is under 30 years of age. And I've seen this at the gallon shows that we've done in the last three or four years. They weren't even born when these <laughs> records were made. So it's not nostalgia for them. It's that they've discovered that rock music has this incredible impact on their life. And they want to see a great rock show. So that's, that's, the, that's what's beautiful about it. it. It has stood the ultimate test, which is time. Absolutely. You know, and... That's something I noticed. I had uh, photo passes for the Laval show, and I was right up at the stage uh, for the first three songs, taking pictures. And, you know, I wasn't joking about the man tier. When I was standing in front of Tommy Shaw and JY, I was like, oh my God, these guys are the reason I like rock and roll. Yeah, yeah um, right, right. Are you guys aware of the impact that you have on people? Uh, quite honestly, we see it. I mean, I we end every day. Tonight will be no exception, you know. I, I, I'm, I'll just uh, look up to the rock gods for affirmation of that and knock on a piece of wood. Um, we end the day with a few thousand people on their feet with big grins on their faces. And when you look out at that, and some of them have got, <laughs> this is incredible to say, it, some of them have got tears in their eyes, <laughs> you know. Um, I And I understand that. I've had, I've had that when I've seen McCartney, you know, so. Oh yeah, that. you know. So, so quite, quite honestly, yeah, I, I, I know now that the uh, the impression it made on me as a teenager playing on my little record player in my bedroom, um, that was not there was nothing fake about that at all. That was a sincere connection to the type of music that just has permeated my whole existence. So I'm no longer surprised by it. You know, I'm just grateful for it. Thanks so much and good luck tonight. Cheers.